Welcome to Market Radar. We're not investment advisors, security analysts, or brokers. The following information is strictly for entertainment and educational purposes only. None of the information here is intended as a buy or sell recommendation. Welcome, welcome to another Market Radar podcast. It's June 11th. The year-to-date performances for the S&P 17 point na- down 17.93%. NASDAQ down 27.4%, Russell down 19.72%, Dow Jones down 13.47%. All major indexes are still bearish trend, not surprising. Our matrix is now uh, totaling 76% chance of risk off, so that's stagflation plus deflation. Stagflation odds remain unchanged from last week at 41.6%. Deflation, slight tick up to 34.4%. Inflation, also a slight tick up to 19.4%. So we are still in deep stagflation. Nothing has changed. Let's look at ES for this past... Actually, sorry, let's look at the calendar first. So Monday, we've got no market moving events. Tuesday, we've got PPI final demand. Wednesday, pretty busy day here. Retail sales, Empire State Manufacturing Index, import and export prices, business inventories, housing market index, EIA petroleum status report, FOMC announcement, Fed chair press conference, Treasury International Capital. Thursday... We've got housing starts and permits, jobless claims, Philadelphia Fed Manufacturing Index, EIA Natural Gas Report, and the Fed Balance Sheet. Friday, light day, we've got industrial production. Also, just note that Friday is the quadruple witching. That's when the whole options expiration happens, where um, you got quarterlies and you got um, you got quarterlies and you got weeklies expiring in the same day. So that's something to watch out for. Yeah, now let's take a look at what ES did this past week. Pretty hefty week. Um, We were sideways for about seven days. I think it was seven days. And um, yeah, the last two days, complete gonging. Um, Likely due to the CPI numbers that came out. But it really uh, really wasn't a surprise to us, at least. If you're paying attention to what commodities have been doing, you kind of saw it coming. You know, we we did a we did a poll on Twitter, and majority of you uh, of our followers said that they're expecting a higher CPI print. So, I think a lot of people expected it, but you know, we're not the majority. We're kind of a select few, like you that are following us. Where you, you you guys are in the know now. We're keeping you in the know. So yeah, what you guys know, most people don't know. And yeah, that's a, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So we're kind of ahead of the game, and that's what we want for you guys. We want you guys to to be in the know and to be able to make smart decisions. Let's yeah, look at ZN. Don't, and don't end up being a bag holder, right? Yeah. Don't end up being a bag holder, like a lot of people trying to buy the dip on bonds are becoming now. Yeah. As we said, you know, a lot of people were getting FOMO in May with this, uh, with the bond bounce. And we warned you, you know, that's not, that's a fake out. That's not the, that's not the real bounce. Don't get FOMO. Uh, we're still in a rate hike environment. And sure enough, ZN did pull back and we're now making new lows. And we're going to continue to make new lows as So far, in current conditions, we got to see a real shift before we change our theory. Yep. Um, Obviously, this has been signaling uh, an unfavorable trend for since uh, since October of 2020. So um, it's been considerably. um, I should say it's been it's been bad to own bonds this entire time, Um, and I don't. I don't see this pivoting anytime soon. And this is where we're going to rotate into what the um, interest rate probabilities are. So let's start with, um, with the Bloomberg 
interest rate overlay. So let's go to uh, last week. Let's go. Let's see what we were talking about last week. Where? Excuse me. Sorry. Yep. So last week we went over that uh, the hikes into December's meeting or including December's meeting was about eight implied rate of 2.82. That was where we were last week. Now, what happened this week? We had CPI. CPI came in at a new, uh, at a fresh uh, 40 year high. In, uh, in turn, the hikes, the, uh, the odds or the, the, the expected rate hikes are going to rise because the Fed is obviously not doing enough. That's what happened. So let's see where we are now. We're going to go to as of, uh, as of today, we are now almost at 10 rate hikes. So we went up al- almost two, point, two rate hikes this week just from the CPI number. So the, ex- the implied federal funds rate in December is now 3.24%. So let's, let's go and take a look at what that means. So here we are. This is an overlay of the federal funds rate, the CPI year-over-year rate, and in the dotted yellow line that you see on the chart is the um, expected or the implied rate as of December of 2022, the end of the year, basically the 22, 2022 end of year rate, which is 3.27, um, excuse me, 3.24. I don't know why this is, says that, but we will fix that right now. So 3.24, there we go. So what does this mean? Well, this means that this blue line is expected to go to here, to this yellow dash line by the end of the year. Okay, it's it's implying that this is going to basically go up over um, over two hundred and fifty basis points. And I mean that's that's realistic, right? If you look at previous points in time with a CPI rate like this, like the the Fed was hiking along with inflation as it was rising, right? Right. So let's just look at back in history, right? So um, in two thousand seven. Um, the Fed had to basically from 2004 to 2007, the Fed to prevent that, that 5% CPI print, the Fed had to really hike rates. You see like the, like almost um, a little steeper than a 45 degree angle, right? But it's, it's just grind. It's basically going rate hike after rate hike after rate hike. And then we have the, um, we kind of kill inflation. Then we have the whole disinflation 2009 event and the Fed has to cut rates accordingly, right? So uh, back in 2018, we have inflation running. Um, you know, we're, we're building up here above that 3% mark. Fed, Fed thinks we're going to get runaway inflation. Um, they, you know, they want to, they basically want to hike rates and, and, and subdue that issue. Now, um, we are at between, it's really 83 basis points. Bloomberg says our effective rate is 83. I don't know why this is 77. Regardless, you know, close enough. Um, we are at a 8.6, uh, 8.6 or, yeah, 8.6% CPI, right? Um, yep. This didn't update. That's why. I'm sorry. So, yeah, it's 8.6. Uh, and federal funds rates are still under 1%. So, uh, last time to, to fix the inflation problem, the Fed had to really push rates to like two, uh, 2.5 roughly to, to subdue that, um, that what they were saying was, you know, accelerating inflation. And so, one of the big questions now is, Will the Fed hike by 75 basis points next meeting? That's a good question. So right now, um, we're expected to have a 50 basis point rate hike. We aren't high enough right now. I mean, we'll bring up the Bloomberg odds, right? We, we have a 2.2, right? So obviously, a quarter, a quarter of a quarter is just, you know, we, we, can't, we really want to pay attention to the, to the um, first number. So it's really low two. So the odds are that we're going to get a two to uh, a double rate hike. So a 50 basis point hike. And then July is where this gets interesting. We're at 4.6. This could grind higher to five, right? And that's not five in July's meeting. That's five from here, meaning that's that's 75 basis point rate hikes. So you take five minus two, you're left with three, right? So three times 0.25 is 75. Mm, okay. Right, so it is. That, it is on the table. It is on the table. Yeah. So it's implying that we're gonna have ten rate hikes. Um, obviously, after July, uh, June's meeting, if we get two, this would go down by two. Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. So that's how this works. This isn't this isn't nine um nine rate hikes in this meeting. Obviously, that would be catastrophic. Yeah. No, would... <laughs> yeah. 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 Um. But yes, that's how this works. Yeah, so yeah. here we are right now. Obviously, um, the federal funds rate usually uh rises to subdue inflation. Last time inflation was this high, the federal funds rate was uh, 12 percent. Um. I, I I don't. I don't think we're going there, uh, but as you can see, we are way too low. The Fed is now faced with runaway inflation, and they need to act faster than what is being priced into the market. Remember, this is what's priced into the market. The market has this model built into it. This isn't like some special, like, um, you know, we figured this out, or this is like some backdoor thing. The market knows this information, okay? So the market knows that... Um, Inflation is 8.6, it, it, new highs. The market knows the Federal Reserve is really low. So the market's telling you that uh, the, at least the uh, Fed Fund's futures market is pricing in almost 10 rate hikes by the end of the year to fix this inflation problem, right? They're expecting mm -hmm. the Fed needing to do this because I don't see how, um, you know, 3.24, I don't see how you fix this under, under the prior peak, right? Let's just make a simple bet. A simple, okay. This is really simple to fix this whole inflation issue. The federal funds rate will have to go above the prior peak to fix this type of problem. We didn't have to go above the prior peaks all these times because inflation was somewhat grinding lower. Yeah, inflation never really got bad. Yeah, now it's bad, and the federal fund, like everyone's saying, like, oh, you know, the major thing that everyone wants to point at is this. Uh, they like to go like this. Uh, let's take the lock off and let's look at the, uh, like this, right? So 1990, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, wrong chart. Uh, let's go in the blue. It's, it's something, it looks something along the lines of this, right? And we're going to come down here. Long-term federal funds rate. Continually grow. This is the chart. Everyone's like, "Oh, the Fed won't go above uh, above above the prior yeah, high." Yeah, because a random line that you draw on a chart predicts yeah. what the Fed does. Yeah, <laughs> yeah this is kind of this is kind of like the uh, remember the whole TLT um, yeah. thing. Yeah, the whole yeah. TLT. Yeah. Like, oh, bonds, yeah. bonds, bonds are, are not, hitting the trend line. Yeah. yeah, they're hitting the trend line, so they're not going to reverse. <laughs> Haven't heard about that trend line since. I, I don't yeah, know no. what yeah. who, who would have thought that a line can't predict macroeconomics? Yeah, I know, right? I mean, like. This is obviously an issue here. We have a spread, okay? Um, I mean, let's see. Let's let's do something quickly, right? Let's take. Oh, yeah, this I wonder if we can um, compare historical spreads. Yeah, US IRYY. Um, this is not planned, so like we don't, you know. I'm just kind of women this here. So let's see. Let's take off the inflation rate. Okay. This is the spread between the federal funds rate and. The CPI, the last CPI. So the spread Obviously, has never been this big, ever. ever, ever. That's bad. Some now, what can fix this spread? Right, inflation coming down and rates going or, up, or rates going up. If inflation just starts peaking and rolling over slowly, this will this will slowly revert. But this is problematic. I mean, you know, like let's look at what happened. Affected federal funds rate, right? Um, new price scale. The last time, every time the spread gets the spread gets down here. Oh, I'm sorry, this is not the right Fed funds rate. Here we go. Every time the spread gets down here, the Fed has to aggressively hike. See? Yeah. I mean, I mean we're talking, you know, here I mean, it, usually like even before the spread gets too big. Right, right, but he even like here was this this whole thing was um, 2008, but even even here, right? So the difference between th this is basically the the curves inverted, if that makes sense, right? So yeah, like the lower the number, CP the the larger the, the spread. The higher the CPI is over the Fed funds rate. In yeah. here. The Fed funds rate actually climbed uh, in 2019. It was negative, and they were afraid of this whole inflation problem, so they they hiked positive, and then they had to revert basically in COVID. But now we're we're negative, and we keep dropping. I mean, this really started accelerating in G January of last year, um, but and then really just started taking hold in like November. You know, obviously November was just really just nose diving here. Um, August 2021 to November, and we started nose diving again. So. What the spread is basically telling you is that 
um, we are in a position that the Federal Reserve has to do one of two things, right? Either inflation is going to come down and they do nothing, or they're going to have to cure inflation. Now, let's take a look at the Federal Funds chart again. Unfortunately, um, let me overlay, sorry, inflation, CPI, here we go. To, to cure this problem, um, waiting for inflation to come down might take too long. Like, there's a different, so I guess the way to put it at it is, is if, rate, if inflation is 4 or 5%, waiting is one thing, right? But inflation is, is now 8.6 and not shows no signs of stopping. We just hit a new 40-year high. So it's almost like um, if the federal funds rate was hiking, 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 and this was like slowing, maybe they could, they could pause, right? Like realistically, if inflation puts in a peak, the federal funds rate could, or the, the Fed can pause, right? Because now um, inflation's peaked and they don't want to really destroy inflation, but they, they, they want it to come down. They need it to come down fast though, but not, they don't want yeah. to, you know, they don't want a 2008 event where- They within, don't want to um, trigger like massive deflation. Right, right. So uh, unfortunately they may have to, they may have to blow out the rates to really kill inflation, but in turn, it's going to really destroy inflation. They're trying to find the middle, right? They want to hike rates just enough to kill inflation, but not destroy everything. Um, yeah. but they're at 0. 0.7, 0. 0.8 and inflation's at 8.6. So there's obviously a problem here. Um, and I think that this whole talk of the fed pivot is, um, kind of thrown out the window. I, I don't know how you have a fed pivot, right? Mm -hmm. How do you have a fed pivot with inflation at 8.6%? Yeah, well, also it's just, why do you want a fed pivot? You know, well, like a lot of people are saying, oh, we fed pivot and then market rallies to, you know, hundred percent, but that's not going to happen. If the Fed pivots, shit's going to get way worse. Well, I don't think the Fed can pivot, and I'll tell you why. No, they definitely so, can't. Right. Well, I mean, they're basically getting hounded. I mean, Jerome Powell, I mean, Jerome Powell, Biden's having meetings with Jerome Powell about this. And I mean, we're on to like blaming like shipping container companies now. Yeah. No, like I, like I. <laughs> blaming everyone I, I but themselves. Yeah. And this is just not one sided politics. This is, this is all politics. Every politician. Um, the politician, the job of a politician is to gather attention and, and gather votes. And that usually comes at the cost of not actually solving any problems, right? Um, we have a fundamental problem in, in, in not just this country, but in the world of kicking the can down the road. If it's the politics, if it's the Federal Reserve, if it's just um, your daily life. Procrastination is like one of the major reasons why people are incapable of being successful, Right. Like they'd rather do something later. It's it's not they don't want to do it now. But unfortunately, like things have to get done. Um, usually, uh, the things you want to do have or the things you have to do or should be doing are at the most inopportune times, right? Like you're you know going to the gym, right? You should be going to the gym at five five six o'clock in the morning before work, right? But like no one really does it. Yeah, because no it's one the wants hardest to do time it. to do it. Right, but like that's the best time to do it, right? Yeah. That's how that works. Because when you come home from work you're tired, odds are your workout isn't going to be that good. I mean, granted, some people can do it, but you get my point, the, the gist of my message, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the problem with politics is um, a po politician is only allocated a certain amount of time for maybe eight years if, if he's lucky. And um, in the first four years, he's going to try and do everything in his power to secure the next four years. So it's almost like the first four years, his sole focus is to convince everyone he's doing the right thing for the next four years. So if he does something that's supposed to be done, but not liked by the public, it, it, it's almost um, like stabbing himself. Why would he do that? Yeah. Right? That, that's so only going to get done in, in the next four years. Which if they get it might, it, yeah, and it might, it might take eight years to do. So now he's starting something in the last four years that the next president is going to throw out the window. So yeah. it's like, it, it's just a, it's a, an entire shit show. Um, unfortunately, that's, that's what this is. Now, this goes to the Federal Reserve the same way. Uh, you know, everyone was saying, oh, Powell is going to uh, revert, or not everyone, there's people. I, again, I, I tend to exaggerate when I say these things. There, there's people um, that say that Powell is going to have to revert course into the midterm elections for, for political reasons. I, I don't see how that makes any sense. I mean, well, that, that's, you know, that's worse for getting votes, you know, like yeah. runaway inflation screws over the, the regular people, you know, so we're at, the, we're, at the they... point, we're at the point where inflation matters more than the stock market. Yeah, definitely. Right. Yeah. Like, because think about it like this. Everyone has to go to a gas station or depending on what car you drive. Right. Everyone has to go to the grocery store. Let's put it that way. Okay. And, 
you know, a lot of people have to go to the gas station. Most people who don't have electric cars. These are the things that they see and have to spend money on by, you know, every other day, bi-weekly, weekly, whatever, right? So the stock market is like a long-term thing. A lot of people have in their retirements. Oh, they're pissed the stock market's down 30%. But granted, like we could all come to the general assumption that five years, 10 years from now, the SPY will likely be higher. Making the, uh, making the bet on the under is, is like, uh, you know, it's not, pro- it, it's, it's, the odds are not high that, um, you know, the market is going to be under uh, the all-time high five years from now. Yeah. Right? And also so, not, like, more people see the effects of inflation and get affected by it negatively than people that hold stocks. Right, right. That's that's what I was getting at. So that's where we're really sitting at right now is is the situation that um, inflation is more of a more of a, a citizen aware is, is citizens or, or uh, residents are more of the of, of countries are more aware of inflation because forget their 401ks or the IRAs or their retirement accounts or whatnot or their individual accounts whatever their their everyday life is now being affected by inflation so it's something that has to be handled uh, you know swiftly and and, and smoothly so I, that's yeah. where we stand on and we don't so, we think that this this end of year target for the Fed is a lot of people say the Fed won't get there I mean. I don't see how the Fed. Um, I don't. I don't see a reason yet why the Fed should not be there. Make sense? Yeah. And bottom okay. line, seventy-five basis point hike definitely on the table. Uh, yeah, and that's for um, that's potentially um, either July or September. September we're at um, September we're at two point six nine rate hikes right now. Uh, uh, from from uh, uh, excuse me, so yeah, September's meeting we're at like a two point some. Uh, I think it's two point six. It's very hard for me to tell going far out here. Well, people... also, they they might not stick to that schedule, right? They could have an emergency rate hike if things do get bad. Yeah, if things do get bad, they'll do that. But I know uh, that's that's really out there. I mean, so we're we're we have two rate hikes. We have four at po- four, almost almost four point six. And then we have um, 6.7. So um, we'll see um, you know, where we're going to go in, in September. Right now, we're, we're, we're expected two and then potentially three. But depending on how inflation goes, what I was trying to get at here is by September, this could be a th- Like, we may not get a, three, a 75 basis point um, hike in July. But if things keep on going, like September likely will be a 75 basis point hike. Make sense? Yep. Okay. Right. So let's keep let's keep going here. Let's um what we wanted to talk about this this podcast was really the yield curve. A lot of people have no idea what the yield curve is or how it works, um, and why it's important. And and so, why it predicts most recessions as well. Right. Good. Yes, we're gonna, we're gonna go over that too. So let's go over um just the ten year treasury briefly. This what the ten year treasury is is the ten or the ten the yield is the yield on a ten year government bond treasury bond right so right now they're yielding three point one six all the way we they, we were at two point seven uh, end of May so like this is has gone up rather quickly and this goes back to the point that we said this um, for months now that the bond trade doesn't come until inflation peaks and rates don't stop until inflation peaks obviously inflation took out. Uh, going into Friday, inflation took out a new high, so bonds rather are going to rally with it, right? But let's get to what the yield curve is. So this is um, the middle, the kind of middle of the yield curve, and we're going to look at our website, um, you know, marketradar.com/slash market analytics. On the bottom, there's a yield curve. This is updated once a day at the end of every day, and this tells you, um, it gives you kind of a broad view of the yield curve. So. We use the three month, the two year, the five year, the seven year, the ten year, the twenty year, and the thirty year. Okay, everything in white is non inverted going out. So we start over here, meaning it's non inverted. This rate is not higher than any other rate. The two year, this rate is not higher than any other rate. Now the five year is red because this rate is actually higher than the ten year and the, and the seven year. So this this is inverted. This yield is inverted against the rest of the curve going to the right, not to the left. To the right, yeah. So on and so forth. Inverted. This not inverted. And a normal yield curve should be sloping upward. There shouldn't a be norm- any inversion. Yes. A normal yield curve should not have any red bars. Simple. Yeah. Okay. 
longer now, term longer term bonds should be paying more than shorter term bonds yeah let's see um let's see if i can pull this up here okay so this is a good analogy um i think you guys should be able to see this right they could see this right yeah okay so let's uh let's use a red pen here just just to to simplify what does this actually look like well what this looks like is if i were to draw an x at every peak of every bar okay and we're going to connect the dots that's the yield curve right so let's let's connect this so it goes like this it goes like this it goes like this it goes like this so i know it's very it's rather hard to see we're going to go over it in green uh or in in blue just to just to clarify uh, i can't even see that Forget uh, that it. makes it um, even harder to see <laughs> yeah it makes it, it makes it harder to see it's okay i think it's good it shows up yeah too. yeah yeah so let me see maybe i can scroll in um no okay so let me full screen this so um as you can see the slope is flat that when, when when you um look at a yield curve and you say the yield curve is flat as you connect all these dots you see how there's no real slope going out after two years yeah exactly and what what that's the what that's telling you is that the yield difference between um between a two-year and a 30-year is um 13 basis points meaning if you buy a two-year today and you buy a 30-year the, your reward for taking an extra 28 years of risk is 13 basis points. That's ridiculous. Yeah. That's, that's, the, that's the whole point of the yield curve. It's showing you that realistically, the risk that you're taking on a two-year is really no different than the risk on all the other iterations. Which, why buy a 30-year bond at 3.19 when you could buy a two-year at 3.06? yeah right now what but what is this telling you let's simplify this for those that are listening that may have never heard or looked at a yield curve the yield curve is showing you that 30 years from now the rate's going to be 3.19 of, of, of a 30-year bond so that means 30 years from now the 30-year bond will be trading at 3.19 right this okay. is saying this is saying two years from now will be at three point oh six. So it's basically saying that in that the federal funds rate is going to not exceed this barrier. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's essentially pricing in two years from now of rate hikes. Right. And well, just remember, there's going to be a premium over the federal funds rate and a treasury bond, right? Because that's just how it works. You're not going to get mm -hmm. them at par. Yeah. But what I'm saying is. Your, your two-year treasury, they're implying that rates are going to go down over the curve. Like the, Fed, like the Fed's going to have to cut rates as we go out in the curve. Why? Well, they're saying that right now, rates are going to be high, right? But 30 years from now, they're not going to be higher than where they are right now, which means that the Federal Reserve is likely going to peak out somewhere here and have to cut again. Based on today's current information, pricing out 30 years, right? Yeah. What we, what we know today extrapolated over 30 years this is what we're looking at it's very flat meaning the the risk the risk premium is dissipated over time okay so there, there's no incentive to take longer term risk because the federal reserve is seen as you know not basically not hiking anymore like obviously we're not hiking for 30 years straight right so that's where the yield curve comes into play as you know 10 year and two year it's a, a nine basis point spread meaning that 10 years from now, we're looking at a yield curve that is rather the same than where we are right now, meaning the Federal Reserve is not cutting as much, right? It's not like they're cutting, but obviously this, is, this will invert over time as the Federal Reserve hikes rates. And I think that we need to clarify this because what I'm saying to you right now might not make any sense, but when we go into the, we're going to bring this chart back, we'll, we'll reference this a couple of times. So let's go into um, a yield curve spread, okay? And let's take DDAP off. So no one's really confused. Um, and let's, uh, let's, this, this white line is a zero line. Okay. If you're listening, we're, we're going to um, illustrate this uh, a little bit better than we did in the prior, uh, in the prior um, screenshot, because you probably have no clue what we're talking about. So what's the 30 and the five or the fives and thirties curve, the fives and thirties curve is the difference between a 30 year and a five year bond. 
like yield the, wise. the the yield okay. yield okay so back in 2021 early 2021 the spread was 1.6 percent roughly 160 basis points we'll use basis points to make it simple it was 160 basis points we're now at negative six basis points what does that mean so in early january 2021 you were getting excuse me not 160 basis points i'm sorry i was uh I was looking at March 2021. We'll use March 2021. You were getting 160 basis points. Now you're getting, um, I'm sorry, it's February. Uh, I, I'm sorry. It, it, it's February of 2021 is roughly 160. Regardless, now you're getting six. What that means is the difference between the fives and thirties dropped drastically in a, in a little over the last year. So that means... Mean it. Okay, yeah, you, you go ahead. <laughs> No, it's okay. So meaning the rates, let's let's reference the chart now, right? The fives and the thirties. So let's uh let's make this a different color here. Let's see, maybe we can get like a lime green or something that yeah. So the fives and the thirties, right? This was pop when the yield is positive between the fives and the thirties, remember, so a five a five and a thirty is um thirty minus five. It's always the other way around. So thirty minus fives is the fives and thirties curve. It's a little counterintuitive. It doesn't really make sense. You have to un you have to just remember that if it's fives, right? So it's fives and thirties. Okay. Fives and thirties means thirty minus five. Excuse me for my uh my cursor drawing. Okay. So I I'm just trying to illustrate this the right way. So if you take the thirties minus the fives in twenty in in February of 2021, you were at 1.6. That's the difference, right? So that means that the five year was maybe down here, right? And the 30 year was maybe like up here. I'm just guessing. I don't know the difference, but that's my point. That the difference, the curve looked like this. And so that's a normal curve. That's a normal curve, right? That's what that's what the when you look at this, we're isolating. Two, remember, we we are just isolating two components of the yield curve. We're, we're isolating the the fives, right? The fives, and we're isolating the thirties. So we're not is, You know, the the middle here could change. This area could change. Like um, from here, could be different, right? We don't know the values of these in in this curve in the fives and thirties. But what we do know is that the fives were trading lower than the thirties. Normal yield curve. Okay. What ends up happening? The yield curve starts compressing, okay? And let's move this to the side. So the yield curves start compressing here. And we start grinding lower and lower and lower. At this point, we invert. What that means now is the fives are trading above the 30s. So now the, the, the risk on a five-year bond, they're paying you more for risking five years than 30 years. You understand? Yeah. So how does this predict recessions and why is it right. so good at it? Well, the fives and thirties are good, but everyone loves the twos and tens. And that's what we're going to do next. So we're going to talk about the twos and tens. So let, let me just leave. We're going to leave this chart um, and we're going to go on to the twos and tens. So what the twos and tens are, remember the fives and thirties. So if we do twos and tens, it's 10 minus two. So it's going to be the 10 year here minus the two year here. Okay. Right now they're not inverted yet. Okay, but let's go and take a look. The twos and tens are right here. And we're going to turn DDAP off just so we can get a better view. This is what the twos and tens look like. And this is the difference between the two year and 10 year treasury. And this is the one that everyone talks about. The reason why everyone talks about it is because um, you're capturing the shorter term cycle of two years and the longer term cycle of 10 years. Five years is a little long, right? Um, five years is longer than a US, uh, than, than a regular presidency of uh, uh just g giving like um comparisons you know five years is half a decade right so two years is just like a, it's in it's in between that five and and current right so it's it's short term 10 years is a decade it's, it's longer term so you're comparing like shorter not like you're comparing short term yields to longer term yields so you're comparing the risk um short term versus the risk long term now if this inverts you're basically pricing in um, short-term risk, heightened short-term risk. People are willing to take on, or people are willing to not own two-year treasuries 
and basically what they're doing is they're selling twos and they're buying tens. They're selling two year treasuries and they're buying ten year treasuries. What that's doing is we'll bring just we'll bring back the uh, the analogy here, right, or the the chart. There, when you sell bonds, let's erase all this nonsense and um, let's let's uh, yeah, let's here. Okay, so when you sell, when you sell treasuries, so when when you um, liquidate them, the supply goes up, right? So supply goes up in treasuries, right? And what happens to price? Well, bond gets, price, bond price goes cheaper, down, right? Right. So bond prices go down, right? Basic supply and demand, right? But what happened? Again, I'm sorry for my um, my my shitty handwriting here. I'm using a cursor, but regardless. Bond price, bond value goes down. What happens when bond value goes down? Yields go up, right? Yeah. So supply increases, yields increase. Why? Well, because it's, supply... it's cheaper, right? The bond is cheaper to yes. buy. Yes. So the yes. yield is, as a percentage of the price, is higher. There's there's a simple way to think about it, though. Okay. Think about it like this. The supply increases, so they need a higher yield to entice people to buy it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Simple. So now, if we do, um, you know, supply goes down, right? Then dollars, the value goes up, and um, rates go down. Okay. And this is important to understand the yield curve, right? Because we have the two-year and the ten-year. What is happening when these curves are inverting? What is going on? Well, the yield of the two-year is going up, and the yield of the ten-year is, you know, is flat or or going down. Right. Basically, the if you if you were to take um, each of these, okay, the rate of change between the ten-year. So if you go two and ten, right, the rate of change of the ten-year, and we do R O C. The rate of change of the 10 year is going to be slower. So this is slower, right? Slower than the rate of the change, which would be faster. Yeah. And so why, why are people doing that? Why are right. people buying 10 years so, and selling two years? So why they're doing this is simple. They think they're selling two years because they think the Fed is going to have to hike. Right? Which At, essentially in the short term prices well, just, out bonds because just put it yeah just put it like this 3.06 i just showed you this right 3.2 we're, we're expected to get to 3.23 by the end of the year mm -hmm. i mean yeah and let's go last week last week's a good example 2.8 so you see the premium there from last week 2.8 to 3.06 obviously this is a week old but remember into the end of the week we had this we were starting to rip because the bonds have to reprice higher inflation. And the, the, the bonds have to reprice the Federal Reserve doing more now. That wasn't priced in. Okay. And so why would, like, the reason people are selling two years is because why would you lock into a lower rate when rates are going to be higher shortly? Right. Right. But in 10 years, do you expect the rate to, 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 to continue to go higher than where it is right now? I don't know. That's a lot harder to predict. But then, it's, so so the reason the yield curve, this, this is how I'm understanding it, the reason the yield curve being negative, like so downward sloping, predicts recessions is because it's pricing in rate cuts, which rate yes. cuts happen to stimulate the economy because there's a recession. Right. That, that's a good way to put it. So let's, let's look at the, the twos and tens, right? So when they invert, okay, when the yield curve inverts, that's implying that the, the twos are higher than the tens, which right now they're not, but you could see that they just, they literally just were right here uh, in March. So it looks like we're going back to it. What that's implying is that the current rates are too high because realistically, there should never be an inverted yield curve, right? It, this is not normal because the rates on a two year should never be higher than a 10 years. This is temporary. This is not something that lasts very long. Like if you look back in time, it's not something um, that you know. Here we we had a we have into two thousand eight we inverted for a couple maybe a year or two, right? But generally speaking, yield curves don't remain inverted. So 
when they invert, they're implying that the current rate, the current two year, is exceeding the rate of 10 years, implying that something is going to happen to bring down the rate over time, aka rate cuts. Why would the Fed, why would there be a rate cut in a recession, right? Mm-hmm. 10 years from now, do I think, literally 10 years from today's date, is, are there going to be rate cuts? There will be, right? That's what's going to happen. But are we, gonna, are we peaking out right now? No. That's why the, the, the yield curve is like, it, it, it's flat, but it's, it, it should get more inverted over time. This, yeah. Well, especially this, as the Fed raises rates, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that drives and, up shorter term yep. rates. Now let's let's take one more look at the at the yield curve here. So let's connect the dots again with the green pen. Much easier to see. Um, okay, so some people say this is not a full inversion. They are correct. Um, do you want to elaborate already? Because I'm I'm sure you know you can explain what a full inversion means. Well, I mean full inversion. You got to have all of them inverted, right? Exactly. It's, that's and and yeah. it's this is more of a flat. Like they're the right. ones that are inverted are very close together. This is more of a flat yield curve. Inversion, right. and you got to actually have downward sloping. It, inversion would look like this. Okay, so for those that are watching, um, let me see if I can get like a like an aqua. This should show. This is what an inversion would look like. Yeah. A uh, real inversion? Whether we get the three month inverted, that's a different story though, because the Fed controls that. Yeah. And they I could guess... choose they could choose not to invert it and but the rest of the curve would be inverted. That that I would still consider as an inverted yield curve. Yeah. I I guess what we'll do is we'll go like this. This technically is an inverted yield curve. Yeah, right? exactly. Now, why is this where it is? A lot of people say, a, a lot of people like to use this spread, okay? It's uh, the tens, I don't even think I, is, I don't even think I have it, to be honest with you. Oh, no, I do. It's the first one. Yeah, so the difference, the tens and threes. So what the tens and threes are, or the threes and tens, sorry, the threes is a three-month yield, and the tens are the 10-year yield. The three-month yield, let's break this down, is is only able to encompass three months going forward of Fed actions, right? Like we can only go, so three months, the three months we are in June 11th, 2022. Three months from now is September 11th, 2022, right? The three month is only encompassing that window. Now, remember, let's take a look at three months going out. Three months going out, September 11th, we don't even get this rate hike in here. We only have two meetings. Two meetings are in this curve. This rate will be, if the Fed sticks to schedule, right? Um, oh, we're not, well, I'm sorry, we're, we're behind here. The Fed sticks to schedule here, we have six rate hikes. The implied rate, okay, is going to be 2.4. This will go up 110 basis, the three month will be 110 basis points higher. Th- this yield curve will flatten, will continue to flatten if the Fed continues their, their, their rate hiking procedure. Yeah. Because this will go up at a faster rate than these will. Because this these this two year yield, just remember, this two year yield is encompassing from June to June of 2024. June 2022 to June 2024. That's encompassing all these rate hikes. See that? Yeah. And so that's it. And the reason the longer term ones are going to head lower is because they're essentially hiking into a recession. They're going to need to cut. At some point, yes. Yeah. And the, th- the reason the three-month is kind of... Um, well, the three-month has worked in the past at, at points, but that's because you have to look at it. You have to take the facts and circumstances of the situation we're in, right? We are in a, we are in a point where the Fed has to hike from basically zero to, you know, to, to uh, 3.24% by December. So... There's no way a three month could be accurate. This is kind of how this has to this has to be voided. Can't look at this. The rate of rate hikes is so aggressive that it almost throws this this curve out the window. This part of the curve out the window. So let's take let's say for sakes we we throw this curve out the window, right? Okay, um, and we just look at the regular curve. What does this look like? Makes more sense now, right? This is a flat yield curve. Forget this. We'll we'll cross this off. Yeah, three month that. 
don't even really take that into calculation. Right. This yield curve is almost flat. At some point here, we're going to get another 2 and 10 inversion, I think. You know, do, does it happen? I mean, I, I think so, because I think that um, the, the expected rate hikes in the short term need to go up. Um, because we're, what, what has, remember, the, this, cur this matrix here is being priced in, right? So this is being priced in, and we have to execute this now. Or we're not going to fix inflation because inflation is continuing to rise even with all this priced in. Yeah, mortgages so it's, it's are going up. Not enough. It's not enough, and we obviously know the Fed can't price in, um, price in QE, uh, QT. They actually have to do it. They can't just say, "Oh yeah, we're going to do ten rate hikes." You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah, okay, it gets priced into the bonds, right? But it's not really priced into the bonds because the longer you go out on the curve, the more uncertain it gets. As you can see, um. Like, you know, we have this, uh, this weird, this weird bell. If we go out here, we have this weird bell shape, right? I mean, 10, 20, 30, the, the spread is 15, 15, but out of nowhere, the twenties are trading three, four. It's almost uncertain. You know, it's, it's 20, it's a 20 basis point difference between the tens and the threes in the middle. It's like the belly of that is 20 basis points different, Yeah, which makes, it makes no sense. Right? Like how is the tens and the thirties trading the same, but the twenties are higher. Like, it makes no sense. Yeah. That's just uncertainty. Yeah. In the bond market. Right. Which will get resolved um, as time goes on in the Fed hikes rates. So let's go back to the, to the 30s and 30s and the fives and 30s and finish this off. The fives and 30s are now inverted, telling you that five years from now, or in the next five years, rates are expected to be higher than where they will be. Or five years from today, rates are going to be higher than where they are 30 years from today, meaning that we're already pricing in rate hikes or rate cuts. You understand? Yeah. So, but, yeah, it's already pricing in that we're going to hit a recession and the Fed's going to have to cut rates to fix yeah. the recession. Yeah, but there's, there's two types of recessions, right? There's the stagflation recession, which is what we're seeing now where demand, it's going to take a while for it to bleed into demand because typically um, the sticky inflation component stays sticky until demand gets destroyed, which happens in a recession. But until that happens, um, inflation is going to be rather sticky and it's going to be pinned up there. Meaning, you know, we might go from eight to six, eight to five. That's still way too high. The Fed is really between a rock and a hard place and they're going to have to do things that no, like they never really had to do because we're, we're so far away from the curve. If we look at um, the federal funds rate, right? We're so far away that we have to really pick this, you know, pick up the pace here to, to fix this problem. Yeah, they got to get ahead of it and they got to do it quick too because the longer they le let it go, the stickier inflation gets. Yes. You, know, you get wage increases that pretty much solidifies inflation even more because you know you can always raise wages. You can't lower them. So that makes it even stickier. And that's something that... Uh, you, you, mean, you mean the other way around, right? Well, like pe people are getting paid more because of inflation. They can't just like get paid less. Like oh, inflation cooled off. Now you're now we're not going to pay you as much. I'm talking right, like employees. Right, right. Oh, 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 oh. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So that that makes inflation even stickier. But that's that's one of the last things that moves. Unfortunately, as inflation gets worse and the cost of living rises, wages are the last thing to move. And once that happens, that takes time to happen. Um, once that happens, inflation becomes even stickier and harder to deal with. So the Fed right. does have to act pretty quick or else it'll be even harder to stop. Yeah, it's kind of like a runaway. It's called runaway inflation for a reason. Yeah. It just it literally runs and you have to catch it. And if you don't catch it, what ends up happening is um, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Because um, you know that things are going to get more expensive, so you're going to hoard yeah exactly and, so and then demand things, increases yeah and what ends up happening is there's an equilibrium where people won't pay as much and then you have you have natural supply and demand effects but that i don't think that happens at eight percent i think that happens much higher you know gas is um in the northeast here we're at like five dollars a gallon pretty much um and i i you know we're talking like gas you know gas probably starts seeing that peak demand effect at like eight eight nine dollar ten dollars a gallon but mm -hmm. i mean I mean, you, you can't really look at it like that because um, in California, it's already 8,000 a gallon. And, well, you know, I, I think 
you know, in the East Coast, we'd probably need to near that ten dollars a gallon mark to really um, create that um, complete demand destruction because it people, uh, quite frankly, they can you know, I don't want to say they can, but it they can sustain eight dollar gas. Yeah. Not going to be fun. Not really yeah, going to be definitely shitty. Not fun. But they could sustain it, right? So if it had to go there, people could could afford it technically. What I'm more concerned about, and we'll we'll go on, we'll speak about this in coming podcasts, is the winter heating oil effect. Um, I mean, we will pull the chart up right here quickly while we're uh, while we're talking about commodities. If we go to heating oil, um, you know, we're we're pretty much, you know, in in March we had this big spike in heating oil, but it came down. The winter season of 2022 was. We're a hundred percent higher than where it was in twenty twenty. The winter season of twenty twenty one to twenty twenty two. So let's take a little uh, quick line here, a vertical line. Let's let's look at a uh, winter season, right? So really in the northeast here, it's um just it's about mid October to um about March, right? So we were we were sitting around three, two to three dollars um a gallon. Okay, we're now at four. If this keeps going, the cost to heat a home could be double. Yeah, that's going to be and, a huge sticker shock in the winter. Yeah, and it's something that, you know, some people can't afford. Like, some people really, like, it, it's, it's, it's a huge burden, you know? Yeah, so... Heating, heating homes is not efficient. Bottom it's line, run, Fed, like, Fed really has to step their game up or else there's going to be a lot of chaos. Yeah, there really is, and I, I hope we don't get. I hope we don't see that because some people are positioned better to take advantage. You know, not take advantage. Some people are positioned better to deal with um, events like this, and some people really aren't. Some people, um, you know, they might make, you know, the average or what's the average in America? It's like thirty grand, thirty, forty grand, right? So they might make um, two, three grand a month, and if you told them their heating bill was, you know, a third, thirty percent of their income and rising think about that yeah that's pretty and groceries bad. rising gas for your car right like every like at some point you get destroyed now that this goes back to the demand destruction component where does gas have to go to really destroy demand i i don't it's more of a guess it's kind of like the neutral rate for the fed we don't really know where people kind of say this is enough i will i will quit i, I can't go to work anymore you know what I'm saying? Like gas is too expensive for me to go to work i spend more on gas a week than i um than, than it's worth working we're not there. Yet. I don't. I don't. I don't no, think we're, we're there yet. We're not there yet. But yeah, but that could be a problem. We don't get to that point. Hopefully, we don't get to there because then, but the Fed basically doesn't have to hike at that point. They basically induce it. People just quit. Yeah. Yeah. The default on their mortgage. De whatever. Deflation comes in without the Fed action. Yeah, and but that's not a good default. You're talking about a major offset. I mean, you're talking about labor. Um, labor force. Let's see, labor force. You know. But we're still not above the twenty, the, the pre-COVID levels. You're talking if that happens, you're talking about this going down drastically. People quitting jobs because it's you know you're talking about a, a situation that the Fed can avoid that. But to avoid that, they need to do what everyone doesn't want them to do. They need to continuously hike. Yeah, and this is the predicament we're in. But I think um, that's a good place to leave it off uh, this week. Um, we'll pick this. We'll pick this up with uh, inflation next week. We're going to consistently go over inflation until inflation is subdued because. It is literally the most important part of the macro model right now, given that we're in stagflation. Remember, um, the stagflation being high inflation, low growth. Once inflation subdues and we go to deflation, uh, we won't talk so much about it because inflation is so sticky right now. It's very important to follow it closely because, um, as you can see, we're hitting new highs. So we want to make sure we're on top of that because that's going to predict where we are in the regime cycle. Once inflation peaks and really falls apart, we'll be uh, longing the longing bonds to the hill you know screaming to the hills the long bond leverage bonds will be holding for the ripper so until that happens though it's a lot of sitting on hands and patiently waiting